The final problem on the conservation of angular momentum with collisions homework is pretty tricky. Uh, it took me a couple times to get it right as well. And there's two things that make it really difficult. Um, first is the fact that they don't give you any numbers. That's something that the College Board really likes to do on AP tests. They just like to give you a whole bunch of variables and ask you to come up with a expression that'll work for whatever numbers they throw at you. The second part that makes it really tricky is you have to use two things in order to solve this equation. There's both a collision going on and then you have to use conservation of energy because the objects uh, have kinetic energy to begin with and end up with gravitational potential energy. So those two things really make this a tough problem. Um, so we have a uniform rod and a point mass. Uh, the point mass is going to collide with the rod at a distance d from the fulcrum and it's going to hit and it's going to stick. So uh, in the question it says that when it does that it, it has just enough speed that the rod and the ball together go exactly 90 degrees, perfectly horizontal. Okay. And so we want to know what initial speed is required for it to just barely go completely horizontal. So we have a collision and we have some conservation of energy stuff. Let's start with the collision stuff. So whenever you deal with collisions, you know it's going to be a momentum question. So, angular momentum, uh, it must be conserved. That just means that the total initial angular momentum has to be equal to the total final angular momentum. So there are two objects, so we need to find the initial angular momentum of both the point and of the rod, and then the final of both the point and of the rod. We know that the, the sum of both of those need to equal each other. So. Uh, angular momentum is equal to I omega, so I omega plus I omega of the rod. Since the rod isn't moving, its angular velocity is zero, so it doesn't have any momentum, just like an object sitting still doesn't have any momentum. So that's zero, thankfully. And that's going to be equal to I times omega final, I times omega final. So we're lucky... Um, those moments of inertia don't change. Like, we don't have a girl walking to the end of the rod or anything like that. Um, so the moment of inertia for a point mass is mr squared. Uh, we're looking for the translational velocity, not the angular velocity. So let's go ahead and convert that omega into something more useful to us. Um, remember that v is equal to r omega, so omega needs to equal v over r. Should be familiar from your uh, kinetic energy equations. Okay. So that is equal to... So I have omega f here written in green. Since they stick together, we're able to uh, factor out those omegas since they're moving at the same angular speed. It's just like when two objects stick together in a translational collision, we're able just to add their masses. Okay, that looks pretty good uh, for our angular momentum side. We can cancel out a couple of r's. So we get m times r times v is equal to the sum of my moments of inertia times omega f. Yeah, um, that's pretty much all we know to do right now, so we have to turn to conservation of energy in order to figure out what to do next. So we can't really um, use conservation of energy from the very, very beginning. We're only interested in kind of what happens after the collision. So right after the collision, both the rod and the particle uh, have rotational kinetic energy. So starting with the particle, it's one half I omega squared plus the kinetic energy of the rod, which is also one half I omega squared. Uh, this part is slightly tricky. We have to figure out how much gravitational potential energy that they each object gained. 
So the point is pretty straightforward. We know that it started a distance uh, d below the fulcrum, and that uh, that distance was 0.8 l. So I'll just plug that in for my height. That is the height that my particle moved. That's how much it gained. Um, the rod is a little trickier. Remember that we're able to treat the center of mass as essentially being the object. So horizontally, the center of mass of the object is just, it's right there in purple. When it started, since it's in the center of the rod, uh, its height is one half L. So 0.5 L. We'll just plug that in for our height that the rod moves. Um, so remember that our end goal is to find that initial velocity that the ball had to start with in order for this to happen. We don't have any translational velocity in our conservation of energy equation, but we do have it in our angular momentum equation. So we want to somehow rearrange my, the angular momentum equations so that V can be in the conservation of energy equation. So the easiest way to do that is to solve for our angular speed. So doing that, m times my radius is 0.8L. It's that distance from the point of impact to the fulcrum times V divided by the sum of those moments of inertia. So um, I'm leaving those moments of inertia the way they are, and I'm going to plug them in at the very, very end. It just makes, um, it makes the algebra a little cleaner. You can still do it if you plug it in at the beginning, but it gets really messy really quick, believe me. So we found omega, and looking back at our conservation of energy equation, I have omega squared twice on the left-hand side, so I'm able to factor that out, and uh, the one-half as well. So I get one half times I of my particle times I of my rod times omega squared. Huh, look at that, the sum of my moments of inertia. That's going to come in handy in a little bit. Uh, looking at the right hand side, I have G in both of those terms and I have L as well. So I'm going to go ahead and factor those out. So GL times 0.8 MP plus 0.5 MR. So now it just looks like we have to plug it in. So we're going to plug in omega final into our left-hand side of the equation. So 1 half times the sum of my moments of inertia is m times 0.8L times v times the sum of my moments of inertia. All of that squared, and that's equal to gl times 0.8MP plus 0.5MR. Okay, that right side hasn't changed. Okay, so when we look at the left side, we see that we have IP plus IR in the top and the bottom. So notice that one of them is squared. So we can get rid of one of the ones that's squared and that one that is on top. So when we do that, just make sure you remember that that top part, that MP times 0.8L times V, that part is still squared. So multiplying everything out, mp squared, 0.8 squared is 0.64, and then l squared, v squared, over the sum of those moments of inertia is equal to the same thing on the right. Oh, thankfully the right side hasn't changed that much. Remember that my end goal is to find that initial velocity of the point mass, so I'm just going to rearrange, solve for v. So getting rid of the one half, two times GL times 0.8 MP plus 0.5 MR times uh, MP times 0.8 L squared times one third MR L squared. So there, this is where I plugged in my moments of inertia, that IP plus IR. So remember for a point mass, it's MR squared. So mass of my point mass times the radius at which uh, it acts, so that's 0.8L squared, 
plus, it tells you in the question that the moment of inertia for a rod rotating about its end is one-third ml squared. So that's where that comes from. All that divided by 0.64 L squared and P squared. Um, looking at uh, the sum of my moments of inertia, the rightmost parentheses, I see that both of those have an L squared. So I would be able to factor those L squareds out, and they happen to cancel with that uh, L squared in the denominator. So that can go away, and those L's in that particular term will go away. It's just like I factored them out. Um, let's see. I also don't like the fact that there's a 2 in the top and a 0.64 in the bottom. Obviously, I am going to have some kind of constant uh, there. I'd rather just have 1, though. So let's get rid of that. The 2 and the 64. Um, the 64 turns into 0.32. Okay, so let's tidy this up. V is equal to G times L times 0.8 M little m plus 0.5 big M times 0.64 little m plus 1 third big M divided by 0.32 M squared. Okay, and then don't forget to take the square root. You don't want all your hard work to be wasted just because you forgot that. So that's the solution.